Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Earlier this year, the Trump administration issued an executive order and two memos significantly hardening the country's policies against undocumented immigrants. But New York joined a number of other cities and counties in vowing to protect its residents from arrest and deportations by federal immigration officials, even at the risk of losing millions of dollars in federal funds. Quote, we will not deport law-abiding New Yorkers, Mayor Bill de Blasio said. We will not tear families apart, and we're not going to undermine the hard-won trust that has developed between our police and their communities. So how has that worked out? Are more of the city's undocumented immigrants being arrested, detained, and deported? Jennifer Williams is a supervising attorney with the Immigration Law Unit of the Legal Aid Society, one of several organizations in the city that are charged with protecting the legal rights of immigrants, whether documented or undocumented. She'll fill us in on how the new federal policy is affecting the immigrant community here and what organizations like hers are doing to push back against it. Welcome. Thank you. So tell me a little about the Immigration Unit, how long it's been around, and just sort of generally, what does it do? Sure. So the Immigration Law Unit, the Legal Aid Society, has been in existence for about 25 years. It started off as a very small unit within the society as, as a whole. And right now we employ over 25 attorneys. We have about six uh, supervisors, many support staff, and we are focused on representing um, individuals in New York who are unable to afford an attorney, whether they're in removal proceedings or if they are looking to um, apply affirmatively with USCIS for a benefit such as naturalization, adjustment of status, things of that nature. Okay. Are there, are there certain kinds of cases that predominate among the different kinds of issues that you handle? Sure. So um, there are, I would say, three major focuses of our unit right now, or four major focuses. One is with the detained cases at Varick Street Immigration Court. Um, we ha There's a, a program, first of its kind in the nation, that was formed in 2013. It's a coalition with Brooklyn Defender Services and Bronx um, Defender Services. And through this coalition, we provide representation, counsel to those individuals facing removal and, the, and are detained. Okay. Um, we also provide pro bono representation for children who are considered unaccompanied minors. These are children fleeing um, horrific endemic violence in Central America and are residing in New York City. We also provide pro bono representation for adults with children. Again, these are uh, mostly women and children fleeing awful, horrific violence from Central America. Okay. As well as on the de non-detained docket at 26 Federal Plaza, those who are in removal proceedings. The funding for the Legal Aid Society, is it a um, privately funded, is it uh, funded with federal funds or a combination of both? Mostly from the city as well as from private. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, I've read that there are an estimated half million undocumented immigrants in New York City. Does that sound about right? That sounds about right. President Trump's executive order removed, it, it changed, and as I said, it hardened the policy uh, uh, against um, uh, undocumented uh, immigrants from what was the policy under the Obama administration. Could you just sort of explain what the difference is now? Uh, than the policy was under President Obama? Sure, it's, um, uh, it's starkly different. And one of the things that is most concerning um, is that this administration has done away with um, priorities for enforcement and removal. Under Obama, the prior administration, um, he was focusing on mostly two, two types of um, removal, which one would be for those who are criminal aliens and those that were threats to national security and those that were recently apprehended at the border. Now there are no priorities for removal. Anybody is at will for removal. According to Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, which is now, what was the previous Immigration? Uh, immigration and National uh, Naturalization Services. Okay, the I, former INS. INS, right, right, <laughs> right, 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 acronym. Um, according to ICE, and I'm going to refer to it, between January 22nd and April 20th, its officers arrested 41,000, about 41,000 people, compared to 30,000 during that same time period last year, an average of more than 
than 400 arrests uh, a day. So the number of uh, arrests and detentions has, has, has in fact, gone up mm -hmm. under, under Obama. Has New York City been feeling this? Those are national figures. Has New York City been feeling it, or how? What sense do you get from as a person who you know works in the immigration unit? Well, we certainly know of um, some raids that have occurred in February and in March, where um, I believe 41 individuals have been arrested in the New York City area. But just very generally speaking, there is just such tremendous fear and anxiety amongst the community. Um, they're afraid to go to school, send their children to school. They're afraid to go to hospitals. They're afraid to go to work. They're afraid to work with law enforcement. Um, to it, report crimes. To, to report crimes, exactly. Um, it's, it, it's very hard for us to advise and to tell our clients what to expect because we just don't know in those early weeks of under the new administration. You know, we were just waking up to bad news constantly. Yeah. Now, it did seem, you know, I was looking at reading some paper that had a, a, a described what these people were arrested for. I think there were eight arrests in February and 41 in March. A lot of those were of um, for sexual assault, rape, robbery, DUIs, mm -hmm. a few fugitives from final orders of removal. And my question is, um, what, you know, what were they doing on the streets in the first place? Mm -hmm. If they had been convicted of these crimes, if there were people who had already gotten orders for removal, what were they doing still here? Right, well, without an individualized assessment, I yeah. certainly couldn't speculate as to why they're back on the streets or why they're back in the communities. Um, it would be impossible for me to say. But if you're looking at people who have been arrested and detained. Um, well, uh, these couple of roundups. Um, can they fight being deported if you're not dealing with somebody who already has a removal order? Mm -hmm. The others who are picked up, you know, because they had committed these crimes. Is there a process by which they can challenge being deported? Or, and, and if so, what's that process like? Sure, if they're placed in removal proceedings and are detained, they'll be held at um, one of three um, detention centers. Where are they? Um, there are two in New Jersey, and then there's one in Goshen, New York. Okay. Um, there are other detention facilities, but anyone who is venued at Barrack Street Immigration Court will be held at um, one of those. Okay. Facilities jails, I should really say, okay. um, where now through the New York Immigrant Family Unity Project, also known as NIFAP, so long as um, they fall within our income eligibility requirements, they will be afforded an attorney who is going to, um, you know, guide them through this process, the removal process. Right. As to whether or not they're eligible for relief, you know, that's a separate question. Do you know if legal aid is handling any of these um, clients who were involved in these two recent roundups? Not that I'm familiar with. Okay. So how does, how does ICE find these people? Sure, mostly through jails or other local um, law enforcement agencies, but there are also community you know, arrests, whether it be at home or at work. Mm -hmm. ICE would just say, well, you know, this guy was ordered removed in November, but he's not been removed, so we're gonna see if we can find him. Absolutely. And go, and go, go to where he lives and arrest him. Absolutely. Um, do we know if any of these people are being turned in by, by citizens? Well, I, I don't know of anyone in particular, um, but I'm certain that that is something that is happening. Mm -hmm. I was reading an article in the Daily News the other day about a New York City landlord who apparently was putting up posters. Uh, he was trying to get move tenants out of his building anyway so he could raise the rent, but apparently he was putting up posters uh, on the building urging people to turn in people that they thought were mm -hmm. uh, illegal so that he could get their apartments and raise their rents was an interesting story. Trump is obviously cracking down more on people who are, you know, either he feels threats to national security or have been convic convicted of, you know, well, crimes. And I guess the question is, if people have committed crimes, why in a, in a country that has, you know, opened its arms to them, why shouldn't they be removed? Why shouldn't they be removed? Well, that's a very difficult question, but I really think we need to just take a step back and think as to, 
you know, the number one reason why they came here. Many were fleeing violence, poverty, horrific country conditions here for looking for a better life in the United States. Um, we also have to take a look and see what they've been convicted of. You know, something as simple as jumping a turnstile could trigger removal proceedings for somebody who's been here for an extremely long time, that are well integrated into the community, who have children here, who are working. Um, so I think it, I don't think it would be fair to have a just sweeping, you know, generalization that anyone who's committed a crime here um, should be deported from the United States. It would depend on what the crime was. Exactly. Okay. All right. We're going to take a short break. Then we'll be back with more with Jennifer Williams, supervising attorney with the Legal Aid Society's Immigration Law Unit. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy, and I'm talking with Jennifer Williams, supervising attorney with the Legal Aid Society's Immigration Law Unit. In the break, um, you were telling me that your clients um, tend not to fall in the category of people who committed serious crimes. Tell me, tell me about some of them and some of their issues. Right, so you'll see a lot of clients who have um, very low level um, type of crimes, misdemeanors, um, possession of a controlled substance, pettit larcenies, grand larceny, and those will trigger removal proceedings. Um, so we, we don't see, as, as some may expect, the hardened criminals, the rapists, the murderers. I've hardly, if ever, seen folks with those type of convictions. Mm -hmm. Tell me about some, you know, maybe some, I, I know you can't mm -hmm. give clients names, but, you know, so, give me some examples of some of the cases you're, you know, you've seen handled and mm -hmm. what you're able to do for them and what you feel about uh, the policy that has put them in these situations. Sure. So, unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of folks who are long-time lawful permanent residents who have been living in the country for sometimes decades at a time. And for whatever reason, an old conviction may trigger an arrest by ICE. And these are individuals, again, who have had, you know, married, family, working, paying taxes, really a fabric of our society, um, who may have a very old conviction that's just been triggered for these deportation proceedings. Mm -hmm. um, we'll see a number of individuals who also are suffering from mental health issues, sometimes folks who are incompetent, who truly don't understand what is happening. Um, people who have substance abuse issues, um, you know, as with the Legal Aid Society, we're helping those who can't afford attorneys. Right. And we'll see them sort of, you know, on the fringe of society. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, does the law, I mean, if somebody, uh, with, with, the, with the people who have substance abuse issues, mm -hmm. I mean, um, is that either possession or, I mean, is that a kind of crime that would trigger under the immigration law could trigger possible removal proceedings? Exactly. Simple possession of drugs here in New York can tri trigger removal proceedings. And in fact, you would be subject to mandatory detention, meaning that you would not be able to seek a bond before an immigration judge for having just one conviction for a controlled substance offense. Well, you know, if you, know, if you are an un undocumented uh, immigrant and you are arrested for possession, how do they find out that you're an undocumented immigrant? I mean, um, my sense was that um, the police department was not necessarily reporting people that it, you know, or even asking mm -hmm. if you're an immigrant. So how does how does ICE find out about that? Well, now with the Secure Communities Program, whenever someone is arrested, those fingerprints are shared with um, the home, Department of Homeland Security. So they're able to check immediately about I somebody's see. status. I exactly. See. Mm -hmm. and, and in the hundred and something days Trump has been in office, have, have you seen more cases like that? Of people with with low-level crimes who have been rounded up. It's always been that way. It's always it's been always that been way. That way. Mm -hmm. My goodness, my goodness. Um, Mayor De Blasio and I believe Governor Cuomo as well uh, has come out strongly against assisting the federal government uh, in its crackdown on undo undocumented immigrants. Um, the NYPD stated policy is that its officers will not enforce administrative warrants issued by federal immigration officials, I guess those are pick up warrants, warrants to pick up people uh, as a result of the expanded de 
deportation policy unless it's somebody uh, who's believed to pose a threat to public safety, um, which I guess makes New York one of the sanctuary cities, you know, that we hear about a lot. Um, I know that President Trump has threatened to cut off federal funds to sanctuary cities, but that has not been, I guess there's some question as to whether that is uh, constitutional, Correct. whether he can, can really do that. As somebody, you know, I know you can't speak for the Legal Aid Society, um, but as somebody who's a lawyer who's been dealing with, you know, um, immigrants and these issues for a long time, we don't, a lot of people are critical of Trump's policy. Um, how would you like to see the policy change or how, you know, what, what kind of policy would you like to see? I know it's a big question, <laughs> but, you know, you dealt with a lot of immigrants. You, you know how these laws affect them. What do you think would, should be our policy right now or sh how it should be different from what it is now? I mean, I think we all hear this. We need comprehensive immigration reform. Um, so many longtime lawful permanent residents are going through, that are going through removal proceedings. It's one of the scariest moments in their lives to navigate through our immigration laws, which are extremely complicated and complex, and often for our convictions that happened a long time ago, that have rehabilitated themselves, that are here in the United States and, and know the mistakes that they have made. Um, the laws are extremely harsh and it's, it's... And this is on green card holders. Correct, exactly. So, you know, we really need to take a look at the laws that were passed in 1996, which absolutely changed some of the grounds for deportation and has, um, I think at this point, is part of the reason why we have the regime that we do, the deportation regime that we do. Um, especially after the, t the September 11 terrorist attacks, we saw... The laws got tougher. Exactly. You said uh, one of the areas, um, some, of the other, some of the other issues, I know you deal with, uh, with, with children, mm -hmm. uh, un undocumented children. Are these children who come here by themselves? Mm -hmm. They're alone, and that, that would primarily be through the Mexican border? Correct, yes. And how do they wind up in New York? Well, if they were in a detention center at the border, some of them will be released into the custody of a family member here in New York City. There would be some kind of uh, proceeding to determine whether they are, what, eligible under, uh, as, as refugees or, or asylum, asylum seekers? And some of them for special immigrant juvenile status. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, and do, do a lot of them get sent back? Do most of them, are, are most of them able to remain, or how does it break down? Well, we know that children are being sent back. They are being sent back to Honduras, to, you know, to Guatemala, to El Salvador, to these hor horrific country conditions. Mm -hmm. But we are also, as a society, been very successful in, in obtaining asylum for our clients as well, or special immigrant juvenile status. When we talked the other day, you mentioned um, so, so what are some of the other issues that facing immigrants? You mentioned, for instance, exploitation by uh, notarios who, tell me about that. Right, so we, you know, their folks are gonna prey on the most vulnerable of immigrants today, giving them promises, promises of a green card, promises of work authorization, promises to get them out of jail. Um, you know, there's just so much confusion and fear that they are, they fall prey very easily to folks who are taking advantage of them. So they pay a lot of money and then nothing happens. Nothing happens. It's sort of like the people who claim they can fix your credit, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> which, which they really can't. How about employment issues? Is that something that you deal with? Employment issues or uh, work conditions, is that something that, that you guys handle? Well, the society has an employment law unit. Okay. And we're certainly looking at those individuals who, um, you know, who are immigrants who may not be getting the wa the wages that they deserve and earned. Um, but but that's not part of my unit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, domestic violence, women who, uh, immigrants who are suffering from domestic violence. Is that something that you deal with? Absolutely. So you know, we'll see clients who may be eligible for VAWA. Um, What's that? Um, Violence Against Women Act. Uh -huh. So if they've been married to a U.S. citizen or a lawful permanent resident, they'll be able to um, apply for an affirmative benefit under VAWA to adjust their status. 
So how did she happen to come to work for uh, at, at Legal Aid and in the immigration unit? Sure, so I was an evening student at New York Law School and I used to walk by 49 Thomas Street and I, I just knew that this is the legal aid, the legal aid, okay. society, the criminal practice, and that's where I've always wanted to be and to help individual New Yorkers, vulnerable New Yorkers, poor New Yorkers, and defend them. Are there things that you have learned um, working with uh, immigrants, documented, undocumented, that um, you think many citizens don't know about immigrants? Mm -hmm. Are there mis a lot of misconceptions that people have that you have learned are not true? Well, I think this goes for anything in life. Um, once, it, it, when I work with a client, it's like peeling the layers of an onion. The more you get to know them and understand their stories, the more you get to realize um, that they're an integral member of our community, no matter where they're from, no matter what they have done. And, and, and we cannot just assume, and we can, you see this now as sort of good immigrants versus bad immigrants. I think that's very dangerous rhetoric and we need to avoid that. There are other organizations in New York City that provide legal representations to immigrants as well, right? Uh, and you told, you, um, there's something called the New York Immigrant Family Unit Project, which is fairly new. Tell me about that. Sure, that was formed in 2013, first of its kind here in the United States, where we provide representation to um, immigrants who are facing removal proceedings and are detained. Okay, that's specifically for specifically people who are, who are, who are facing um, removal. Um, and that was funded, is that funded by the state of New York? City Council. The City Council, mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Now, um, Trump has said he has no plans to mess with DACA. That's the Deferred Action for Ch mm -hmm. Childhood Arrivals, which I, that was initiated by Obama, right? Right. Uh, and I gather it gave uh, people who arrived here illegally, but as children, I had been here for a while, a two-year deferral against deportation, and it gives them eligibility for work permits. So what happens after the two years? We don't know, and that's what's quite scary. I believe there are about 75,000 DACA recipients. Mm -hmm. We don't know if it's going to be received. In New York? No, or no it, the, the, pro, the program in general. Nationwide, okay. Um, so we don't know what's going to happen to DACA. Did DACA ever put these uh, people in line to become permanent residents or just deferred Absolutely any kind of... Not. Uh, Right. It did it's, not. It's not an amnesty program. It doesn't give them any status here in the United States. It just defers their deportation. Okay. You, we've got about, well, less than a minute. <laughs> uh, in, in which I want you to tell me, what are your big, biggest concerns about the Trump administration going forward as pertains to immigrants? I think my biggest concern is if he does, in fact, act on his promises to deport the 11 million undocumented immigrants. There are going to be huge economic concerns, social concerns. Many families right now are unsure of what will happen to their children if a parent is going to be deported. Um, they're going to be very serious short-term and long-term effects of what is occurring now and if he actually makes good on his promises to deport the 11 million undocumented immigrants in the United States. The huge consequences, huge consequences. for everybody, yeah. for everybody. Okay, I, I'm afraid we're out of time, uh, but um, I think I can say appreciate the work that you're doing. Yeah. And it's, you know, immigration, it's, 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 a, it's a difficult issue. It's a complicated issue. It's a tricky issue, but it really affects a lot of people in very dramatic ways. I want to thank Jennifer Williams for joining me. If you'd like more information about the Legal Aid Society's Immigration Law Unit, you can call their detention hotline at 212-577-3456 on Wednesdays between 1 and 5 p.m. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy. If there are any people you'd like to hear from or topics you'd like us to explore, please let us know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. 
I look forward to hearing from you.